Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, your host, and today we're sitting down with Calgary City Council candidate for Ward 9, Naomi Withers. Naomi, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Chris, thanks for having me. Naomi, I'm going to start my interview off with the same question every candidate for this municipal election gets. Where's your sense of duty to serve come from? Chris, thanks for that question. Uh, I am born and raised in Ward 9. Um, so this is where my roots are. And so that's why I'm most excited to be running uh, as the councillor candidate for Ward 9. Um, I was lucky enough at age four to receive a house through Habitat for Humanity. Um, and so that hand up um, really helped propel my family um, to be successful. And so since that age, um, I've always seen service and community and volunteerism as one of the values that I have. Um, and so I've held those values close my entire life. And I think that this is a way to represent that um, in a professional stance uh, as city councilor for Ward 9. Um, I also um, have consistently tried to give back as a community member. Um, when I graduated university, I started a, a scholarship fund through the Edmonton Community Foundation for Métis students pursuing postgraduate education um, because we need opportunities uh, for citizens um, who might be less represented in some of those professional roles. And as a Métis student who applied to law school and got in, um, but didn't have the funding in order to advance my career in that way, I saw that it's another opportunity to fill a gap where we really need to give back. And I'm looking for more ways to give back to a community that's given to me. Now, politicians aren't born to be politicians. They usually have an itch to give back in one way or another, whether it be nonprofit organizations, whether it be volunteerism, like you said. But in 2021, you've decided you were going to be the politician. You're going to throw your hat in the ring for city council. What was it about 2021 that made you think this was the year? This was the year that I want to give back, and this is how I can give back in this way. Absolutely. Um, so this isn't just something that I thought about uh, running for in 2021. Um, it's something that we considered as a family for a, a long time. Um, specifically, the last five years, I've been involved in the community association in the neighborhood I live in. And I've had the opportunity to advocate for our citizens and faced what seems like a brick wall sometimes. Um, community has needs. Um, they require a voice in decision making. And then when the city of Calgary moved to close some of our inner city pools, specifically Inglewood and Beltline, I started Save YYC Pools. And that petition garnered 30,000 signatures to try to be the voice of Calgarians to City Hall and say, we need amenities in our inner city neighborhoods. And it took that conversation and the requirement of 30,000 signatures to say, is the citizen's voice being heard and represented at City Hall? And to me, the answer was no, um, when we needed a petition of that magnitude. And so we have been working um, to see how we can adjust how City Council operates to make sure that the citizen's voice is really heard at City Hall. And so that's part of the catalyst for running right now. Um, I also feel like at this time, I have the right business skills um, and community mindset that will make a difference at City Hall, that uh, I have the experiences that will make City Hall successful and make our city successful and make our community successful. Now, before we start talking about some policies and what you're hearing at the doorstep, because that's what really the show's about, is what you're hearing at the doorstep and how you would be able to address it. I want to continue on about you and who you are. Um, you, you talked about uh, your volunteerism. You talked about your upbringing. But I want to get to know the political you. Was politics always in your body? Was it always something that you always thought maybe one day I'll run? Was it talked about at the family dinner table at night? Or where did your political bug come from? Absolutely. Um, so uh, Calgary Stampede, oh gosh, a dozen years ago, maybe long, no, two dozen years ago, I, um, I met Stephen Harper and I told him that I was going to be prime minister one day. And so there's always been um, that ambition uh, in my life to make sure that I can represent citizens and that I can give back in a big way. I knew that I had the capacity and the capability to be a leader in our community um, since a young age. And so with that, I took a degree in international business. 
from the University of Calgary. And through that process, I learned about trade policy. I learned about working with different cultures. I worked, learned about strategy, um, stakeholder relations. And so through my university degree, I thought that I was shaping a career potentially to renegotiate NAFTA. I was going to be the Krista Freeland. Um, although I didn't know her name then, I sure know it now. Um, but since that time, I've become a mother. And I realized that I can affect the most change right now in municipal politics. That's awesome. Um, so you are running in the upcoming election, October 18th. Uh, any good candidate, as this is going to be coming out in September, any good candidate has been door knocking, has been door knocking, door knocking, door knocking. Actually, you are literally door knocking probably about 20 minutes after this interview is completed. What are you hearing at the doors? What are the people telling you? Because before we talk about what your platform is, I want to know what you're hearing at the doors that city council needs to do or change. Absolutely. So yes, we are door knocking every single day, multiple shifts a day. We've got volunteers behind us um, and we bring our lawn signs with us so we can get them straight out uh, into community and get that name recognition out there. Um, but we have been door knocking all 17 communities in Ward 9. And although there is some diversity across the wards, there's something that is always the same and people want to be proud of where they come from. People want to make sure that their homes are their sanctuaries and that they're safe. They want to make sure that their tax dollars are spent effectively. Um, and then more specifically, we're hearing really personal stories. Neighbors are really willing to share with us their experiences. Um, we've heard from neighbors who are struggling with housing, who are potentially getting evicted next week and want to know what the city of Calgary can do to support them. We're hearing from seniors who have had to cancel their home insurance because they can't afford their property tax. We're hearing from neighbors who think that the speed limits on their roads are still too high at 50 kilometers an hour if it's got a yellow line down the center and they wanna know how we can slow traffic down. Um, we're hearing from moms who want spaces for their youth to go after school, um, somewhere that's safe and where they can learn and continue to grow. And so, Within all the neighborhoods, we are taking notes, we're actively listening, we are feedbacking to citizens right now about the resources that exist that they can use. Um, but we're also brainstorming about how we can either better advertise resources or how we can change the way that we do business as a city of Calgary to support those Calgarians. You've listed off a lot of the topics and I, I'm, I'm glad that you've listed them because that's how this interview will go. I, I'm going to be talking about some of these, but some of these issues that you've just mentioned, but I want to start with one. You, you, candidates will always have an idea of what they're going to hear at the door. They're always going to have that idea of I'm going to hear about taxes. I'm going to hear about snow removal. I'm going to hear about garbage collection during the time that you've been door knocking has there been issues, whether it be that personal level of issues that people may have, that you've looked at someone and said, I didn't think this was an issue, but I'm glad that someone's bringing it up because that's how this election is going to work when people bring their ideas and their issues to the forefront? Yes. So we have heard so many things at the door. Um, one of the community members that I spoke to in Southwood was, was actually a, ref, a political refugee um, from Chile. And so those conversations um, have been quite interesting on how we work um, with our different levels of government when it comes to bringing in people to the country as a sanctuary. Um, so that's something that is not necessarily part of our realm as um, municipal politics, um, but something that we need to advocate for to the different levels of government. Um, another thing that we've heard at the door is around transit. Um, I was privileged to sit on one of the transit committees when we were reshuffling the bus routes in the city of Calgary quite a few years ago. Um, but we heard from a senior citizen that says it takes three buses to get to the Greater Forest Lawn 55 plus center. Um, they live in Aaronwood. And so really digging into some of those issues, because that to me, that's a quality of life issue that the city can actually address. Um, and I don't have the answer for it right now, but I know that as a city, that is something um, that we can work on. And sorry, um, it was Southview, not Southwood. I apologize for <laughs> hey, getting that no, community name. No Linwood, word. Southview, we're, we're, we're door knocking every community. <laughs> 
hey, you got 17 communities to door knock. I can imagine that it's hard to potentially keep track of where all the issues are coming from. But as long as you're out there door knocking and hearing from the people, that's all that matters. And I give you props for even uh, doing that, especially during COVID-19. Um, I, 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 might, I might not you know, get the exact community name right, but I sure remember the issue. And I remember who asked me about it and I make sure that I communicate back with them because I think that this needs to be a two-way conversation. I think that's what's been missing at City Hall is that it's a two-way conversation. And I see that um, right in our faces when we talk about attending city council meetings and a citizen gets five minutes to speak. And then that's the end of the conversation. It's only if council chooses to ask them a question or ask them to elaborate. And then council always gets the last word. Um, and so they don't, the citizen doesn't get a chance to really either continue that conversation or make sure that their points were understood. And I think that's part of what I wanna change at city council is making sure that we continue to have two-way conversations with community members. So I was gonna start talking about policy, but you've brought up a great point. And I wanna make sure we talk about this because this has been a crux of my uh, issue about politics in general is politicians get elected, they go away, and they don't talk to their uh, constituents or the people who elect them. You you have just said that even if people bring forward something at council, they have five minutes to speak. They have five minutes to speak and council has the last word, yet they should because they are the ones who are voting on the issue. How do you change that narrative? How do you change that narrative so that way people feel like they're being heard because you can listen to someone for five minutes, 20 minutes or an hour and 20 minutes. They still at the end of the day might walk away and say, I don't feel heard. And I'm playing devil's advocate here. I'm not trying to say that's the right way or wrong way to do it. I just need to know from your perspective, how do you get people to feel like they've been listened to? Absolutely. So I think that we need to step back from having those conversations at city council and start having those conversations in community. So your counselor's office should be at your community association meetings. Your counselor's office should be hosting all president's meetings with the community associations on a regular basis so that we can have those conversations about what's happening in community before that there's a problem we need to address. Um, we need to, what I've called a community coalition where we bring in community leaders, business leaders, community associations, and we have regular conversations. And as a counselor's office, we can rely on those organizations to gather the citizen's voice and feedback it into the counselor's offices so that we <laughs> have an understanding of what community is looking for and how we can build policy to support them. So I think that you have to take the conversation outside of those five minutes at city council which is actually really inaccessible to most people. Uh, for the Richmond Green conversation, community members were on hold on that uh, council meeting call for two days. For Hunger Fruit on 17th, they were on hold for three days, sitting in council chambers, waiting for their five minutes to speak. To me, that's unaccessible to most Calgarians because we have day jobs, we have families, we have other commitments. And so we need to make sure that the feedback mechanisms that we have as a city of Calgary are accessible to everyone. And I think by opening up that accessibility, um, we will have the opportunity to hear more from citizens. Now, as a, a potential elected official here on October 19th, you will be hearing from everyone. And let's be honest, some people who may disagree with you, and I think as a counselor, as a candidate, you know that you will have to represent the will and the needs of everyone in your ward. How do you envision working with people who may not vote for you, who may not, who may say what you're doing is wrong, but you still need to address their issues because they might say she's not listening to me because she, I didn't vote for her. So she's just not going to talk to me anymore. How do you get past that narrative? And this is, this gets into the, you being a counselor and I love this conversation. So I want to know, how do you, how do you represent everyone in your ward who may not vote for you? So I know everyone won't vote for me. Um, I hope that they do. I think that I'm the best candidate for the job. Um, but what I can say is in my day job, which is in supply chain, I negotiate contracts for a living. And when I make a decision, I use a decision criteria. I, ahead of time, before I open any bid package, I say the evaluation is based on technical merits, on pricing, on social factors. And I think that we need to bring that level of 
um, waiting to our decision making at City Hall so that we can be transparent to this voter on why we're making decisions the way we're making them. And so if we as a city council agree that we're going to put some transparency to our decision making, even at a minimum level saying, this is how many community members reached out to me who were for or against an issue that we're voting on today. I think that we can create that accountability that even if a citizen might not have voted for me, they understand and respect my decision making criteria at City Hall. So again, I, I'm just picking up from what you're saying. Uh, if 15 people come to you in a hypothetical situation, say, hey, I, I'm using your uh, scenario here of save the pool. Yep. If 15 people come to you and say, hey, we need to close this pool and no one comes to you and says, hey, we need to keep this pool open. How do you vote on that issue then? Because you, you're taking the metrics of what you're hearing from people uh, you would probably want to do some talking for yourself and talking to the people who would be affected. But if only 15 people talk to you and say, hey, I want it closed, would you have to vote to close it? Or would you then look at it as a more in-depth issue? So absolutely, it needs to be a more in-depth issue. I think if only 15 people reach out to a city councillor on an issue, then we've not done our job to actually engage the citizens of Calgary to say, how does this affect you? Is this how you want your tax dollars spent? Um, and so I think that if only 15 people reach out to any councilor or the mayor on an issue, then we've not done our job um, in making sure that our population is engaged in decision making. Um, and the citizen's voice is one piece of decision making, but we also have to weigh the economic and social benefits of any decision. Um, and so we have to see, do we have budget for it? Can we? <laughs> generate budget for it? Is there a return on investment if we keep these pools open? Um, does the city have the money to sustain a project like this? Um, you know, the Inglewood pool, I was swimming there two weeks ago and there was a gentleman that came in just to use the shower. And so we really need to think about how our services are used <laughs> and not just for their intended use, um, but for how Calgarians work within the city of Calgary and what they view an amenity as. And so, yes, it's about the citizens' voice and decision making. But again, we need to balance the social and economic impacts of our decision making. And that's our job as city council is to weigh those, the citizens' voice and also the economic. Um, and that's why I, I use the, the two pillars of my platform is business smart, community heart, because as a city councillor, we're the board of directors of the city of Calgary, and we have to manage the budget, um, but we also need to advocate for citizens to make sure that Calgary is a vibrant, thriving community that attracts um, residents and keeps residents. I'm glad you talked about your two pl uh, pillars of your platform. So for those who are listening to those who are watching, uh, Naomi's uh, website is Ward 9 Calgary. That's Ward the number 9 Calgary.com. It will be linked in the show notes. So please go in, check it out if you're in Ward 9, or even if you're not in Ward 9, you want to learn more about Naomi. Uh, Naomi. Um, I want to talk about those two pillars because um, what does, in your words, in your, in, 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 like, and a 15 second sound, but if you had 15 seconds to describe what business start community start is, what is it for those who are listening right now? Uh, so for business smart, it's about understanding fiscal accountability, making sure that every dollar we spend gets a return on investment, making sure that our city has a strategy for the future and not just a five year plan, but a 25 year plan to make sure that we have jobs for the next generation. And then when we go to Community Heart, it's about really understanding that Calgary is a city, is a city of communities um, and communities hold each other up. We are um, who we rely on when times are good. We are who, are who we reach out to when times are bad. And we need to recognize that that Western hospitality that Calgary is known for, um, that's what I want Calgary to continue to be known for, is a community that cares and a community that we're proud of. Um. You talked about fiscal accountability and the biggest elephant in the room that the next council is going to have to deal with is the recovery, not from just the COVID-19 pandemic, but also the economic downturn of the oil and gas sector. Calgary has been up against the ropes in the last 10 years because of these two major issues. How do you envision being fiscally responsible when you now have two major economic uh engines that have basically decimated the finances of our city because 
people are struggling right now. And if people are struggling, the city struggles. How do you envision yourself being able to work with everyone to ensure that everyone gets uh, ahead in this uncertain economy, but also Calgary gets back on track? Absolutely. So I've been lucky enough to work in oil and gas um, the last dozen years, and I've managed to sustain my career, um, which I know a lot of people haven't been able to do. Um, but my husband has actually moved out of from his, his original job, which was a geoscientist, into data science. And I think technology and innovation is going to be one of the next engines to drive the economy in the city of Calgary. We've reached out at the doors, um, people who are in tech who say, you know, what is Calgary doing to attract these businesses? Um, and so we need to do more to attract technology and innovation companies into our city. We need to do more to provide spaces for artists and arts and culture to thrive and be an economic engine for the city of Calgary. We've spoken to people at the doors that say, I can't fill the engineered air theater. I can't fill a 300 seat theater, but I want to perform and I can make money off performing um, if only we had the right size venues to allow for it. So I think the city of Calgary needs to work with our partners, um, be it through the Chamber of Commerce, be it through Calgary Economic Development, um, Arts Commons Transformation, to make sure that we're providing spaces so that we can have these opportunities for other sectors to come in and add to the economic engine of the city of Calgary. I also think that we need to focus on small business. 90% um, of small biz of business in Calgary is considered small business if you they have less than 100 employees. And I think small businesses are one of the economic engines of our city of Calgary. And we need to make sure that they are taken care of when it comes to COVID. I think as a city, we need to use um, our ability to maybe, sorry. I think that as a city, we need to use property tax tools uh, to work with those small businesses to make sure that they can actually pay their bills um, and potentially provide a delay in their property tax bills for two years to make sure that they can turn the wheels again um, and have the money to sustain themselves and then to support employment in our local neighborhoods because they are the meaningful employers in the city of Calgary. Now, a resident listening to that would say that that sounds awesome. I want to start a business. I want to be a, potentially be able to uh, hold off on paying taxes for two years and pay it after that two years. But then the other resident would say, hey, I'm not a small business owner, but I'm, have, I'm struggling right now and I want to potentially do something. Why can't I get a break in my taxes right now? So what do you say to those people, uh, to the, the residents who are saying, I'm financially struggling right now. I'm financially struggling just like the small business. And while it's great to help businesses, we also need to help our residents as well. And I'm just playing devil's advocate. I, 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 I probably have heard that once out of the conversations I've done in the last probably about 15 years, but I yeah. want to know from someone who is advocating for that, how do you do it? So Chris, I, what we've heard at the doors, I mean, a lot of the communities is that citizens are willing to pay tax for services. So I think we need to change the conversation that citizens are willing to pay tax for services. Um, as long as they know that their tax dollars are spent in a meaningful way, um, citizens want to contribute to the city of Calgary. And so that's that's what we're hearing at the doors. Um, we have heard from some people who are struggling with their property tax bill. And what I advocate for is that the province of Alberta has a tax deferral program if you're over 65 years of age where you can defer your taxes until the time when you sell your house. Uh, the city of Vancouver has that program starting when you're 60 years of age. And so that's something that I will advocate to the provincial level to see if that's a program that we can support as a province to make sure that citizens can stay in their homes long-term if they're struggling with their property taxes. Thank you so much for answering that question. I want to turn to the topic of safety because it was the first or second issue that you talked about when you said you were when you heard from residents what you they were talking at the doors you talked about speed limits in their uh communities um i i want to know when you talk to the residents when you door knock when you're out there listening to people what is it about feeling safe that they would like change is it uh, more like lowering that speed limit or is there other issues that they're talking about feeling safe to make sure that they when they are in their home they feel like it is their abyss and they can live and just enjoy themselves absolutely so 
when me personally, when it comes to feeling safe in my home or my neighborhood, I want to be able to walk down my street and not be afraid um, when, you know, the street lights come on. I want to make sure that the property that I, I have in my backyard is going to stay in my backyard um, when I'm not uh, in that space. Um, when we're crossing the street, we want to make sure that they're well lit um, and that the pedestrian crosswalks are well marked so that you can safely cross the street um, without fear of being hit by a car. I was able to advocate for a traffic circle and speed bumps along my road. Um, and that's something that I will continue to advocate for, for other neighborhoods, that traffic calming measures fit the neighborhood. So that although we have a 40 kilometer an hour speed limit restriction on residential roads, that might not be what stops the cars from going too fast. And so working with communities to find out what they need specifically, um, because every community will have a unique need when it comes to safety, especially when it comes to traffic. And so working with those communities to make sure we understand and make sure that their needs are met. I know that as a city, we need to make sure that the lights um, on our lampposts are constantly lit. Um, and we shouldn't be relying on citizens to submit 311 complaints that their street lights are out. Um, those should be the jobs of the city of Calgary to make sure that our neighborhoods are well lit, um, that the Calgary police are patrolling every neighborhood equally, um, and that when you call 911, they're able to respond in a fashion that actually has them coming to your house when you need them. Um, yeah. One of the big issues that has been talked around safety is the Calgary police. Uh, it, you are not a, a, a unique candidate of asking this question, so please don't take it that way. But there has been conversations about defunding the Calgary police, and uh, whether that be through reducing the service, uh, the money that the city gives them, or whatever. What is your opinion on the Calgary police force today? And I've asked this to all the candidates. So yet again, I'm not, not trying to be rude here, but how do you how do you look at the Calgary police today? And is uh, the defund the police, uh, I, I don't want to say protest, but is what is what the people who are advocating for defund the police the correct avenue? Or is there another avenue that we need to look at when it comes to policing in Calgary? Absolutely, Chris. So I think one of the, the thing that I wanted to bring up first is when you refer to Calgary police, you refer to them as the Calgary police force. And they're the Calgary police service because sorry, they are there sorry, to yes. serve Calgarians. And, but that's, that's something that we hear in community often um, is they are the Calgary police service. So they're to serve Calgarians. I think that we need to give CPS the tool um, to approach the different calls in different ways. Um, they need to be able to understand when their call is actually someone reaching out for mental health support that, you know, we don't approach it as a crime. We approach it as someone reaching out for help. And so I think that providing education to our members is one of the key things, uh, making sure that there's diversity on the Calgary police and um, that they represent the communities um, that they're serving. I was a volunteer with Calgary Police Service when I was a member of CALAC, the Calgary Aboriginal Urban Affairs Committee. And under that volunteer role, I recruited Indigenous police officers to the Calgary Police to make sure that they felt comfortable with a role in policing um, and that they were able to look at that as a meaningful career. And so I think that reflecting the community um, that they're representing in the police service is one of the ways that we can change the story about the Calgary police. Um, I believe that putting mental health supports in the district offices so that when officers have calls, they can come back to you know, the district and debrief with someone about those calls so that they can learn from those experiences and be better prepared next time. I think that there is systemic racism in our system and we need to really have truthful conversations about how that's manifested so that we can change the story about how we all respond to um, crimes in our neighborhoods. I feel like we could probably talk about this issue for probably another hour and I, I'm just cautious of time because I don't want to keep you longer than I have to because like I said you do need to go door knock because you are a candidate. I, I want to turn for a second to a word that you just mentioned, and it's on your brochure, it's on your website, but authentic. 
authentic, authentic, authentic. You say on, on your website, under your message, uh, my promise to you is I will listen and be authentic. What does authentic mean to you? And how do you envision bringing that to the people of Ward 9 if elected on October 18th? Absolutely. So um, when I talk about my platform of an accessible city, I've made my campaign accessible. Our platform is available in Braille, it's available in Ukrainian, it's available in Chinese, it's available in Farsi. Um, I'm representing that value of an accessible city as best as I can in my campaign right now from the start. Um, this is my living room. Um, this is um, when you call 809-7963, that's my phone number. I answer the phone. I'm the one having conversations with Calgarians. Naomi at ward9calgary.com is my email. I answer it. The Facebook posts are Naomi Withers. And so I am the one that community members are getting to have these conversations with during the campaign. Um, and so I think by representing that, um, right now in the campaign, I'm proving myself to Calgarians that I am the ear that is listening. And I will continue to do that. I have, um, I'm out on my doorstop every Wednesday at four o'clock, uh, available to my community to have those live conversations. I'm at community events having live conversations. And so authenticity to me is really representing the values of my campaign, of relationships, of integrity. Um, of authenticity and making sure that um, everyone on my campaign team represents those values as well. Um, I, I want to jump into the time machine here and put yourself on October 19th. October 19th, you are the councillor designate for Ward 9. What is priority number one for you? It is building back relationships with community members that have been broken. It is building back relationships with our community associations. It is building new relationships with people who I don't have relationships with right now. Um, it is fostering the relationships with our other levels of government to make sure that we as a city council can work efficiently with other levels of government. We are funded through the provincial government for most of our services. I have had conversations already with uh, Premier Kenny. I have had conversations with Rachel Notley. I have had conversations with the MLAs in my area um, and the members of parliament in my area. And so on October 19th, I am reaching out to all of the stakeholders who are the decision makers to make sure that we can come back and sit at a table um, with no division, with no predispositions of how things should be and making sure we're starting off on a clean and fresh foot. I think that's one of the nicest things about this election is where you're going to have at least nine new councillors um, with those that have chosen not to run or who are running for other levels of government. Um, and I think that fresh start is exactly what the city of Calgary needs to bring us out of the economic downturn from oil and gas recession, the economic downturn from COVID, um, and really give us the ability to create that vibrant, thriving community. And number one is relationship building. Now, as someone who uh, is in business, you know that you need to put metrics into how you conduct yourself for the first year, for the second year, for the third year, or if you're working on a project, you need to put metrics on, this needs to get done X, Y, and Z by these dates. Um, yet again, jump back into that time machine, put yourself one year into your first term. What metrics are you putting in place to make sure that you have a successful first, not first term, but first year in office that in 2022, you can go back and say, you know what, I got A, B and C accomplished for you. I, I, we still have work to do on them, but these are the things that I was advocating for. And these are the things that I am delivering to the people of uh, Ward 9 right now. Absolutely. Um, so one of the things that I've talked about in my platform is amenities. And so what I'd like to see is the city of Calgary really look at their recreation policies and see where we can provide more year round amenity space for all of our neighborhoods. So I definitely want to see traction on amenities in Ward 9 in the first year. Um, I also want to make sure um, one of the things that we're talking about is transit. Um, and I want to make sure that we cap transit fare for the city of Calgary. Um, 
community members can't afford 10 cents more every single year. And so I want to make sure that we're working with transit and finding a better way to fund uh, transit and making sure that it's not on the backs of the individual users who are using the train to commute to work or to commute to school um, or to commute to recreation. So I want to make sure that's one of the things in the first year is that we have a plan for transit with the Green Line coming that makes actually using transit economic and accessible to all Calgarians. You, I wasn't going to mention it, but you decided to throw the green line in here. So let's talk about it for a second. Well, green, green line and the BRT, the yep. East Calgary is serviced by the BRT line. So, but the green line is one of the biggest projects that the city will be undertaking over the next few years. It uh, quote unquote should have shovels in ground by this fall, according to our prime minister. I think every Calgarian is waiting until that uh, shovel is in the ground to, to celebrate. So um, as someone who will be representing a, a part of the green line that is going south, because Ward 9, it does not go all the way through, but part of it does go through Ward 9. What are you hearing from residents around Green Line? Are they excited that it's finally getting, is it finally happening? Or is there some uh, temper, uh, some hesitance until it actually gets built to say, okay, we're, we're, we're going to celebrate? So the Green Line's been part of the conversation about um, transit in Ward 9. There'll be two stations in Millican Ogden, Linwood, um, and they'll be the Ramsey and Inglewood station. Um, so the conversations around the Green Line are more about transit oriented, den oriented density um, and what that looks like in changing the dynamics of our neighborhood. Um, and then it's about um, making sure that it's built. Community members wanna see it built. Um, and I think we actually need to build itself all the way to 140th because that's where the population lies, um, is in those suburb communities. And so if we don't actually build it all the way south, then we're still asking community members to get on a bus to commute to the Green Line or to get in their vehicles to make it to a Green Line station to then get to work. And so if we're a city that needs to focus on climate change, um, then we actually need to get cars off the road meaning in a meaningful way. And that's actually putting train lines to where people are, which also means putting a train line to the airport. Wow, you, it is a... The Green Line is going to be one, like I said, one of the biggest projects that this city is going to be undertaking. Uh, I'm glad that you're willing to talk about it and willing to be an advocate for it, because I think, like you said, a lot of people are looking at it as a potential avenue to get off the road because of the congestion and all that. So thank you for even answering the question. Greatly appreciate it, Naomi. I think that, that comes with the authentic, authenticity piece. If there's a question... Um, I'm happy to answer. And that's at the door. Um, we're hearing from neighbors. Well, I'll just ask you one question. I'm like, ask me five questions. <laughs> ask me all the questions that allow me to earn your vote. Because if I don't hear from the citizen, then how can I build my platform? If I don't know what the needs are, if you don't allow me to understand the needs, then I can't represent you as well as I, as I should be. So that's why we're at the doors. Having those meaningful and thoughtful conversations um, to make sure that we are really addressing the needs of the community members. My last big question for you, Naomi, is this. Why should you be the next city councillor for Ward 9? Chris, thank you for that question. Um, my roots are in Ward 9. I have lived in six of the communities that make up the ward, um, both east and west of the Deerfoot. My family still lives in Ward 9. To me, it is such a diverse community um, and it needs to be fully represented at City Hall. East Calgary has so much value to offer the city of Calgary. And I think that that value has been missed in some of the past conversations. As your counselor, I will be the diverse voice. Um, as a member of the Métis Nation, I'm looking forward to representing uh, that group of people at City Hall respectfully. Um, I am looking to represent the voice of mothers. I'm looking to represent the voice of women. I'm looking to represent the voices of diverse communities in Ward 9. Um, and I am really looking forward to bringing about vibrancy to, to the city of Calgary. Um, I'm looking this as the councillor of Ward 9, but I'm also there with a the strategy for the city of Calgary. And so taking that perspective to me um, means that I have the right mix of business smart and community heart 
to really lead Ward 9 and the city of Calgary into a successful, resilient future. In order to get to October 19th or even October 20, uh, 2022, you need to be elected. I'm assuming you are still looking for volunteers. You are still looking for people to come out and help support your campaign. How can people get in touch? While it's great that you are door knocking, it's a large area, 17 communities, as you say, you're going to try and get to every single door, but you may not be able to. How can people get involved, get in touch, ask you a question via social media? What are the avenues that they can reach out to you? So we are online in every sense of the word. Um, the website is ward9calgary.com. Um, and we did that uh, for a reason to make it accessible to everyone. Naomi Withers isn't always the easiest thing to spell. Um, so you can reach out on the website. Uh, the hashtag is Withers number four, ward number nine. So the Withers for ward nine. Um, my email, Naomi at ward9calgary.com. We are looking for volunteers for door knocking shifts. It's just two hours of your time, but it makes such a big impact on the campaign to get that name recognition out there. On the website, people can ask for a lawn sign. Um, they can make a donation to the campaign. Um, we're asking community members if they can donate $33. Um, that gets us five lawn signs out in community. Um, and that is how we are running this campaign is based on small efforts from community members that actually make a really big impact. Awesome. For my listeners and to my viewers, the links to Naomi's uh, website, Facebook page, uh, Twitter, email will be in the show notes. So please, 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 please go out, get involved, learn about the candidates in your ward, because this is the future of the city we are talking about. Uh, and I, I, I want everyone to just get out and vote. Get, I, I've been harking this every episode, get out and vote. I think Naomi has something to say about that. So what do you have to say about getting out and vote? <laughs> Chris, the voter turnout in municipal elections is really quite low and mm -hmm. that you can have a say. Um, if I'm about the citizen's voice, that's why I'm door knocking is because to tell people they can have a say, um, be it just on election day, um, it is the opportunity to express your voice and how you want to see Calgary grow. Um, and opportunities like this uh, to be on your show, Chris, I really appreciate it. And I'm grateful to have the chance to share my voice um, and to you know represent what I stand for um, with the community, with volunteerism, with you know, all of that, but I really want people to come out and vote. Um, be it for me, be it for another candidate, just vote for the mayor. Um, you know, come out and vote and be part of democracy. And for those who are listening who are still apprehensive about potentially voting in person, the City of Calgary has launched their mail-in ballot, so you can request a mail-in ballot via their website. So if you are looking at voting and potentially don't feel safe because of COVID-19, I know everyone is getting their vaccines, but if you don't feel safe, please request a ballot because that is another avenue. Naomi, thank you so much for doing this. This has been a pleasure. Like I said, I feel like we've just scratched the surface. Please go to our website. Please get informed. Thank you so much, Naomi, for doing this. Thanks, Chris. Really appreciate your time and uh, for letting us all as candidates uh, speak to the constituents.